Saudi Arabia is like two worlds in one. Imagine endless deserts next to towering skyscrapers. It's not just about oil and strict rules here. Ever heard of football teams with amazing players who have lost limbs? Or camels competing for beauty titles? Dive in with us to discover 15 weird things you'll only find in this unique kingdom. Number 15. No sorcery allowed. In Saudi Arabia, magic is a big no-no. Think of magic tricks, spells, fortune-telling, even reading about wizards and witches. All of these are not allowed. It's a country where they take their religion very seriously. In their eyes, magic and sorcery are like telling lies about their faith. Now, they don't just say, no magic, please. They have a special team just for this. It's called the Committee for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice, a.k.a. CPEPV. This team has a job that's a mix of magic detectives and teachers. They tell people why magic is bad, find those who do magic, and take away their magic stuff. The CPVPV has been on this magic hunt since 2009. They found many people who were doing magic stuff. Some were workers from other countries. They were said to be using magic to hurt others. Some were from Saudi Arabia itself. They had magic books or videos or even claimed they could fly or heal people with special powers. Remember Harry Potter and his magical world? In Saudi Arabia, Harry and his friends aren't welcome. The CPVPV team thinks stories like these can confuse young minds. They've taken away and destroyed a lot of Harry Potter books, toys, and other magic things. Number 14. Water is too expensive. Would you believe it if you were told that in Saudi Arabia, water is pricier than oil? Yep, that's right. This land of vast deserts and piping hot temperatures has a big problem. Not enough water. Now, it's not just about having a limited supply, but how much it all costs. It's so scarce and precious that it ends up costing more than the oil they're famous for. In 2019, the World Bank shared some jaw-dropping numbers. A cubic meter of water in Saudi Arabia cost 0.09 USD, while a liter of oil was only 0.06 USD. Do the math and you'll find out. Water's about one and a half times pricier than oil there. Saudi Arabia, surrounded by sand for miles and miles, only has 89.5 cubic meters of water for each person every year. Compare this with the global average of 6,000 cubic meters, and you can see why it's such a big deal. How do they get their water, you ask? Mainly from two places, the ground and the sea. Groundwater is what most people drink and use, but it's running out fast. The other half comes from a super tricky process that takes the salt out of seawater. But cleaning seawater is costly and uses up a lot of energy. Guess where that energy comes from? Oil. About 15% of it. Lots of things are making people need more water. There are more people, more cities, more factories, and farms that need it to grow food. In 2020, there were 35 million people living there. And by 2050, they think there will be 45 million. Farming sucks up the biggest share of water, using a whopping 80% of it. That's a lot of water for something that only adds 2% to Saudi Arabia's wallet. So what's the plan to fix this tricky situation? Saudi Arabia is trying lots of things. They're charging more for water, cutting back on how much they help pay for it, and trying to get people to use less. There's even a special program named Katra that hopes to help people cut back water use by a big chunk. 43% by 2030. Number 13. No work, all pray. In Saudi Arabia, there's a special rhythm to the day. No, it's not about clocking in and out of work. It's about the five prayer breaks that happen daily. It's like the entire country takes a pause button and everything stops. From big shops in city centers to tiny stalls in the market, everything shuts down for prayer. How do they know when to pray? It's all about the sun. As it moves across the sky, it tells them when it's time to pause and pray. And the way Saudi Arabia figures this out is using the Umm al qura method. It's their special sun calculator. Now here's the fun part. Imagine you're in the middle of buying a gift, or you're enjoying a meal at a restaurant. Suddenly, it's prayer time. Everything stops. Shops close their doors, kitchens go quiet, and people head to pray. This little break is about 15 to 20 minutes long just enough for the prayers. For those who don't know, it might seem like a surprise. Why is everything closing? But for the locals, it's a cherished part of life. It's like a short break to reconnect with their faith. 
to breathe, and to take a moment away from the hustle and bustle. It's not about making things difficult. It's about making sure everyone gets a chance to pray without distractions. Number 12. No birth control. Saudi Arabia is a place with many traditions. One topic that gets a lot of attention there, birth control. Now, you might be thinking, can I get my regular birth control stuff in Saudi Arabia? Well, it's a yes and no answer. Things like the pill, condoms, and those little devices called IUDs. You can mostly find them in the country. But the tricky part is where and how easily you can get them. And there's one more thing, the morning after pill. That's a no-go in Saudi Arabia. But if you're not married, getting these birth control items might be a challenge. Why? Because being intimate before marriage is a big no-no in Saudi Arabia. Some shops might even ask, hey, are you married? Before selling you anything. And where you come from might change how you're treated at the pharmacy. If you're from another country and living in Saudi Arabia, some people might be more relaxed around you. Number 11. Gambling is a sin. Saudi Arabia says a big nope to gambling. Why? Because in this country, gambling is viewed as a big-time sin. No casinos, no lotteries, not even a quick bet on a sports game. Get caught, and you're in real trouble. We're talking big fines, jail time, or even worse. But some folks in Saudi Arabia have found sneaky ways to gamble. They use special tools called VPNs on their computers. It's like a secret tunnel to visit banned websites without anyone knowing. So using VPNs, they can play on online gambling sites from the comfort of their homes. There's also this thing with horse races. There's a club in Riyadh that holds raffles around horse races. But here's the catch. It's not exactly gambling. How? Well, people don't bet money. They just guess which horse will win and fill out a form. Get it right, and you win a prize. Now, some people love gambling so much that they'll even travel to other countries for it. Places like Lebanon, Egypt, or Morocco welcome them with open arms and big, shiny casinos. They get to play games, spin slot machines, or just enjoy the exciting atmosphere. But it's not all fun and games. Traveling just to gamble can be tricky and costly. So, the big picture? Gambling in Saudi Arabia is a bit like sneaking candy into a movie theater. Some people do it finding their own little ways, but it's always risky. They might love the thrill, but they also have to be super careful. After all, in Saudi Arabia, when it comes to gambling, the stakes are high. Number 10. Say no to PDA. Okay, so you've heard of PDA, right? That's public displays of affection. You know, things like holding hands, hugging, or sneaking in that quick peck on the cheek when you think no one's looking. In many places, it's just another everyday thing. But in Saudi Arabia, it's a whole different story. In Saudi Arabia, which is a devout Muslim country, PDA is seen as a no-no. Why? Because they follow this super strict version of Islamic law called Sharia. And in this law, any sort of PDA is kind of like breaking a big rule. If you get caught, the punishment can be really serious, like hefty fines or even scarier things. A couple of years back, in September 2019, Saudi Arabia thought, hey, let's be clearer about these rules. They wanted to welcome more tourists and show them the wonders of their country. So they came up with this list called the Public Decency Code. And guess what was on the list? Yep, you guessed it, PDA. This code had 19 things you shouldn't do in public. Break one and you might have to pay a fine. Speaking of fines, if you're caught getting cozy in public, it can cost you up to 3,000 riles. In U.S. dollars, that's about 800 bucks. But it's not just about PDA. The Public Decency Code also says stuff like, don't litter, don't jump the line, don't snap photos of strangers, don't blast music when it's prayer time, dress right. Basically, it's a guide on how to be decent in public places in Saudi Arabia. Now, who watches over all this? The Ministry of Interior and the General Authority for Tourism and National Heritage are like the big bosses here. They've got their eyes peeled, making sure everyone's playing by the rules. And it's not just them. There are other agencies and even private security teams on the lookout. If you're in a public place, which can be anywhere from a mall, cafe, park, beach, or even just walking on the road, you've got to follow the rules. Number 9. No Cinemas Ever thought of a world where you can't just pop into the nearest cinema to catch the latest movie? Sounds crazy, right? But that was a real thing in Saudi Arabia. 
For a long time, you couldn't watch a movie on the big screen there. Here's a bit of history for you. Way back in the 1930s, Saudi folks were enjoying movies just like everyone else. But then, in the 1980s, cinemas got a big thumbs down. Some people thought movies were bad news. They said cinemas brought bad behavior and too much stuff from the West. So what did they do? They shut them down. And for 35 long years, no movie theaters. Imagine that. Now, it's not like people stopped watching movies. They found ways. Some sneaked in movies at home. Others used those tricky satellite dishes. And if you really, really wanted that cinema popcorn and the whole movie vibe, you had to travel. Some went to nearby places like Bahrain or Kuwait. But guess what? In 2017, a cool change came. The government said, let's bring movies back. Why? They had a plan called Vision 2030. They wanted to shake things up, bring in more fun stuff, and get the country buzzing. And which movie got the first ticket in 2018? The superhero-packed Black Panther. Since that blockbuster started, movie screens have been popping up everywhere. We're talking over 500 screens and loads of happy moviegoers munching on popcorn. And the big dream? By 2030, they want 2,000 movie screens and people spending a billion dollars just on movie tickets. But it's not just about watching Hollywood hits. Saudi Arabia wants to tell its own stories, too. They're setting up things to help movie makers, hosting film festivals, and even inviting movie teams from other countries to shoot in their awesome landscapes. Of course, bringing back cinemas hasn't been a walk in the park. Some folks aren't happy. They don't like certain movie scenes, or they just think cinemas aren't a good fit. There's also the challenge of building this industry from scratch, and let's not forget the world of Netflix and chill. Number 8. Separate Wedding Ceremonies Have you ever been to a party where boys are on one side and girls on the other? Well, in Saudi Arabia, that's how they roll when it comes to weddings. Saudi weddings have a unique twist. Instead of brides and grooms celebrating together with all their guests, they have separate areas. Yep, the ladies get their space and the guys have theirs. Now, you might be thinking, how does this work? Here's the scoop. The bride hangs out in a space that's like a fairy tale. There are flowers everywhere, shiny candles, and beautiful curtains. She's dressed in this amazing outfit called an abaya. It's a long, elegant cloak. Sometimes she also covers her face with a niqab or her hair with a hijab. And talk about fashion! She can change her outfit multiple times in one night. On the other side, the groom and his buddies are having their fun. The groom looks sharp in a thobe a long white dress-like robe. He also wears a fancy cloak and might have a colorful scarf called a shema on his head. And what are they feasting on? Delicious dishes. Think juicy lamb, fluffy rice, sweet dates, and rich coffee. But here's the cool part. Even though they're separate, the groom does get to visit the bride's side. But it's just him and his dad. They make a grand entrance with a band and traditional music. And then comes the highlight. The bride and groom exchange rings and team up to cut the wedding cake. Now we know what you're thinking. Why have separate parties? It's all about sticking to traditions. In Saudi Arabia, they believe in keeping men and women apart if they aren't married or closely related. This way, there's no chance of anyone saying, hey, what's going on here? It's just their way of keeping things respectful and proper. But the coolest thing? Both sides get to let loose and have a blast in their own way. The ladies can dance, chat, and enjoy without any worries. The guys can joke around, share stories, and have their fun. No judgments, no side glances, just pure celebration. Number 7. Massive Camel Supply All right, if you've ever thought about camels, you probably picture them wandering through the desert, right? But did you know Saudi Arabia has turned camels into a massive business and cultural scene? First off, camels are a big deal in Saudi Arabia. They're not just for riding across sandy dunes. People there value camels for loads of things. Tasty meat, refreshing milk, cozy wool, and tough leather. Plus, owning a fancy camel is like having the latest shiny car. It shows you've got style and wealth. Now, let's take a trip to Riyadh, the capital city of Saudi Arabia. Here, you'll find the world's biggest camel market. We're talking about a place so huge that it stretches over two square miles. And it's like a camel supermarket with more than 100 camels getting new homes every day. Wondering what happens in this mega camel market? It's open super early, from 6 in the morning till lunchtime. The place is buzzing.
people shout, laugh, and haggle to get the best deals. Camels aren't just lumped together. Nope, they're sorted out, just like you'd sort toys or clothes. They're grouped by age, whether they're boys or girls, their color, what family they come from, and how top-notch they are. Some camels are so special that they cost as much as 2,667 US dollars. But wait, there's more. This isn't just a place to buy and sell camels. It's like a fun fair, too. You can see the local Bedouin traders proudly parading their camels, taking them for rides, or even singing to them. Number six, the moral police. Let's dive into the world of Saudi Arabia and explore a unique group called the Mutaween. These folks have a big job. They're in charge of making sure everyone sticks to the rules of Islam. The group's been around since 1940, but in the 1980s, they became a real big deal. Why? Because after some changes in Iran, people in Saudi Arabia wanted to get closer to their religious roots. So, what's the Mutaween's deal? Their job is all about a fancy word called Hizbah. In simple terms, it means they encourage good stuff and stop bad stuff based on Islamic teachings. They keep an eye on things like what people wear, whether guys and girls are hanging out together, and if everyone's showing up for prayers, and if you're caught breaking the rules, the Mutaween might arrest you and hand you over to the judges. This group is pretty big. They've got between 3,500 to 4,000 officers. Add to that thousands of volunteers and 10,000 other folks working behind the scenes. They're so important that their leader is like a top government official and chats directly with the king. Now here's where things get spicy. Not everyone's a fan of the Mudaween. Some folks love them, saying they protect the traditions of Islam, but others? They think the Mudaween's methods are too harsh. Because of this, some changes have happened over the years. The Saudi king and the crown prince have made rules that limit what the Mutaween can do. For example, they can't just chase after someone or ask too many questions without permission. Behind all of this is something called Wahhabism. It's a type of Islam that started in Saudi Arabia a long time ago, like in the 1800s. It's pretty strict and believes in following the teachings of Islam to the letter. And they think they're the real deal and everyone else has got it wrong. Also, Saudi Arabia isn't the only place with a group like this. Other countries like Iran, Sudan, and Indonesia have their own versions. They might have different names like Basij in Iran or Hizbah in Nigeria, but deep down they're all trying to do the same thing. Keep their people on the right path according to their beliefs. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In a photograph from Saudi Arabia, women confidently stand in their undergarments, but curiously, still don their hijabs. Has there been a fashion revolution in the heart of this traditionally conservative land? Could this be a secret underground trend we've been clueless about? Or maybe it's an artistic statement, pushing the boundaries of cultural norms. What's the backstory? Is this a protest, a statement, or just a wild fashion party? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Now, on to the next topic. Number five, no rivers at all. All right, here's something mind-blowing. Saudi Arabia is huge, like really huge, but it doesn't have a single river. Yep, you heard right, no rivers at all. So you might be thinking, where do they get their water from? First off, when it does rain, which isn't often, the water usually collects behind big walls called dams. They're like giant water banks. But the rain is kind of a rare guest. It's like when your favorite celebrity shows up once in a blue moon. They've built 522 of these dams to catch and save as much of this water as they can. Now, the real MVP of Saudi Arabia's water game is what's underground. Most of their water comes from this secret stash. But here's the twist. Some of it gets refilled by the rain and some doesn't. The part that doesn't is super old, like dinosaur old. And it's running out fast. People are using it up, especially for farming, and that's causing a bunch of problems. Let's not forget the sea. They've got this cool trick where they turn seawater into drinking water. They're so good at it, they're like the world champions. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Turning the sea to sip takes a lot of energy, and it's not the friendliest to our planet. Lastly, there's the water we've used and want to use again. Think of it like giving old water a makeover. They clean it up and reuse it for things like watering plants or cooling stuff down. They used 2.6 billion big bottles worth in 2019, and managed to reuse most of it. Number four, ban on women driving. Saudi Arabia is a place with deep traditions. The big family running it, the Al Sauds, have been in charge since 1932. 
Here, a strict form of Islam called Wahhabism guides lots of things, especially for women. Now here's something that might surprise you. For a long time, women in Saudi Arabia couldn't drive. Not a car, not a scooter, nothing. And this wasn't because of some written law, but because top religious leaders said it'd cause problems in society. If a woman was brave enough to drive anyway, she could end up getting arrested, paying a fine, or even spending time in jail. But not all women were okay with this. Many strong ladies wanted to change things. They signed petitions, held peaceful protests, made videos, and chatted a lot on social media. They wanted the world to see that they should have the same rights as men. But it wasn't easy. The people in power didn't like this much. They'd sometimes arrest the women who spoke out and even spread stories about them that weren't true. Then, in 2017, big news hit. The king said that in June next year, women can drive. This was massive. Many people were excited that things were changing, especially because a young prince, Mohammed bin Salman, was all about making the country more modern. But here's the twist. Just before women got the green light to drive, some of those ladies who had been shouting the loudest for change got arrested. People said they were a danger to the country. When June 2018 came around, it was like a festival on the roads. Women who had driving licenses from other countries got their Saudi ones and zoomed around. You could see smiles everywhere. Men even gave out flowers to female drivers to say, well done. But not everyone was happy. Some didn't like this change and thought women should stay at home. Number three, amputee soccer team. Saudi Arabia has an awesome soccer team, but it's not just any team. Every player on this team has lost a part of their body. Back in 1996, some brave guys who had lost arms or legs because of different reasons wanted to play soccer. They loved the game so much and didn't want anything to stop them. So they made their own soccer team. And this team didn't just play for fun. They got super good and started playing in big tournaments all over the world. They've played in the Amputee Football World Cup, the Asian Cup, and the Gulf Cup. And they didn't just play. They rocked. They won a silver medal when they played in Uzbekistan in 2007. They got a bronze medal in Mexico in 2018. And the best part? They bagged a gold medal in Bahrain in 2019. They've even had friendly games against teams from Germany, Brazil, and Turkey. But it's not just about playing and winning for them. These players want to send a message. They want to tell other people who might feel left out because they're different, that they can do amazing things too. A lot of young people who have also lost body parts look up to these players and think, I want to be like them one day. This special team also helps people understand more about those who are a bit different. They tell everyone about the problems they face and how everyone can help. Big groups in Saudi Arabia love what they're doing. They get help from the big soccer group in the country, the sports ministry, and even from a big international group called the Red Cross. Number two, Saudization. So, you know how every country wants its own people to have more jobs? Saudi Arabia has its own cool name for that. Saudization. This is all about giving more jobs to Saudi people and depending less on workers from other countries. Now let's get into the fun stuff. Workers from outside Saudi Arabia need to pay some money if they want to keep working there. And there are certain jobs that only Saudi people can do. It's like a VIP pass for them. This all started in 2011 when the big office that handles work and social stuff in Saudi Arabia thought of a game. It's called Nitakat, which in Arabic means ranges. Imagine a game with different levels and each level has a color. The top level is platinum and the bottom one is red. The aim for companies is to hit that platinum level. If they get lots of Saudi workers, they get cool rewards like super fast paperwork and special rights. But if they end up in the red level, it means they have too few Saudi workers and could get into some trouble. So why did Saudi Arabia start this? They wanted more Saudi people to have jobs. In 2020, almost 13 out of every 100 Saudi folks didn't have a job. They also wanted to make sure their country doesn't just make money from oil. Like having many baskets to put your eggs in. And they have this big dream for 2030 where they see Saudi Arabia as this cool place everyone in the world talks about. Number one, no love in the air. Did you know that while many people around the world are showering each other with gifts and chocolates on Valentine's Day, there's a place where this doesn't happen? Yep, that's Saudi Arabia for you. Now let's dig into why. Many in Saudi Arabia think Valentine's Day is tied to Christian roots. 
They believe it's about a saint who got into big trouble for marrying folks who weren't supposed to get married. Besides the story, some people think celebrating the day might lead to stuff like dating without getting married, which is a no-no there. Here's where things get a bit like a movie. There's a group called the Religious Police and they're on the lookout every Valentine's Day. No, they're not looking for bad guys, but for things like red roses, chocolates, and cute heart-shaped things. If they catch someone selling or even buying these, oh boy, it could mean fines, jail time, or even getting whipped. But where there's a will, there's a way. Just because there's a ban doesn't mean everyone stops celebrating. It's like playing hide-and-seek. Some clever shop owners might wrap Valentine's goodies in other colors to fool the police. Others might use secret code words to sell them. There's even a kind of secret Valentine's Day market where things cost a lot because they're so hard to find. Some folks don't want to play this sneaky game, so they order stuff online or take a quick trip to a nearby country to buy gifts. But here's a fun twist. If you're from another country and live in Saudi Arabia, you can have your own Valentine's Day party. But only in your house or where you live. The big rule, keep it hush-hush, don't make a big show of it outside, and definitely don't post your party pics online. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.